Okay. Um, I'll just say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to meet together and to learn about your word, and especially um, as we close up this time learning about spiritual disciplines, just the many ways that we can come to know you more. And so I pray that you would just bless this time and speak to all of our hearts today. Um, so we're finishing up the series that we've been doing on uh, spiritual disciplines. And um, we didn't get to cover, you know, it's a pretty big topic. There's a lot of things. But this is a, a book that I want to recommend. And I know Ken Edwards had uh, mentioned it as well. It's called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And he's got about 12 different categories that he, he uh, puts them in as different ways that we can hear from God and, and grow in our relationship with him. So um, I would like to recommend this book. Uh, and I got this first one. Somebody gave this to me when I graduated high school, um, a lady in our church. And then I got another copy when I went to a, a ministry school. And we, we actually had like an hour every day just for prayer and reading the word and, and, and spending time with, with um, God, which it's like that's an incredible luxury, I realize now, but, you know, all the 18 and 19 year olds were like, oh, what are we supposed to do for a whole hour? <laughs> so, um, but we went through all the different things and, and practiced them. And, uh, you know, some of them are hard and, 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 you know, I guess that's the point of the book. But then, then I found out that the, the, real, the real value of this book is that you read about all the different spiritual disciplines and then you just find the ones that you're already good at and just focus on doing that. <laughs> and that is a joke, but... But it's also true because the point of having a relationship with God is that we enjoy that relationship. He doesn't want us to do discipline things just because it's, it's difficult or hard. And I mean, some people love that stuff. But if, if that's not the way that you are, it's good to learn about the different ways that people connect with God so that you can find the ones that make the most sense for you. And, and there's certainly value, value in in learning and practicing these other things as well. But um, the first one that he actually starts the book with is about uh, meditation. And I think, you know, as I come to think about it, like this is a really important place to start because this really is a kind of a foundational uh, topic uh, for all the other ones. Because if you want to learn how to be better at prayer, First, you have to ask the question, what is prayer? And anytime we're kind of asking questions about things, we are, to a certain degree, meditating. Um, meditation is not something that we talk a lot about in church as a discipline. Um, I think, you know, we're a little bit uncomfortable with that word because we associate it with mysticism and uh, Eastern religions and, uh, you know, New Age kind of stuff or like there's like mindfulness is like the secular version. Uh, but um, there's really a big difference between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation or Christian meditation. And the, the two main principles of Eastern meditation that are contrary to biblical meditation are, first of all, Eastern meditation is, is always about looking inward, which is, you know, something that we cannot really do. We can't figure out all of what's going on inside of us. We actually need God's help. And that's why in uh, Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So what the psalmist is saying there is that he knows he can't figure out everything that's going inside. But that's what we need God to reveal it to us. Um, and when God chooses to reveal our flaws and our, our, our failures to us, he, he most often does it by opening our eyes. Like if you look in the Bible, that phrase, open, he opened their eyes, happens over, over and over the time, um, again when people have some realization of, uh, of a truth that, that God was speaking to them, but they didn't get it up until that moment. So godly meditation is about seeing and observing outside, not within, so that by, by seeing what's going on, that's how we understand what, what is going on. Um, secondly, Eastern meditation is about emptying ourselves 
and that's something dangerous for us to do. And this was a, a scripture that came right from the book. He made this excellent point. He says, um, reading from Matthew, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it uh, seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Now, you may not be filled with evil spirits, but there are other things that seek to fill a void. And the thing is, is about meditation is that this is something that we all do, whether we're conscious of it or, or not. But what fills the void and what comes in are things like anxiety, worry, distraction, fear, doubt. And, and the best way to combat those things is to instead fill ourselves up with something better. So, and this is the wonderful verse Mandy just shared with us. That's why Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And, you know, that act of thinking, thinking, that's what we're meditating on. And if you are busy filling up your mind with things that are noble and right and, and tr true and pure, there's not going to be a lot of room for anxiety and worry and doubt. So think here, it means to consider, to take into account, to weigh, or meditate on. So that's what we're talking about, meditating. So where does meditation come from in the Bible? And um, one of the uh, earliest mentions, uh, Alex actually mentioned this verse in uh, his sermon a few weeks back, it comes from the book of Joshua. Joshua enters into the promised land with the book of the law that God had given to Moses. And God told him, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn, turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then he says, keep this book of the law, which is the word Torah. So it's not just the laws, it's the whole thing, the stories and everything else too. Um, keep it always on your lips, meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So, you know, as I mentioned, it says that word book of the law, it's, it's Torah. It's not just the commandments. It's also uh, the whole five books of Moses. And in those five books, God gave us a whole bunch of different kinds of, of material he gave us stories. He gave us songs. There's records and like tables of statistics and genealogies. And there are commands, you know, what we typically call laws. But all of these different types of literature are held within it, and they all speak to us in different ways. And we can learn different things from all of them. It, but it also gives us, it gives us an entry point because you may not be really stimulated by the book of numbers and its listings of how many people came from every, every tribe, but, you, but some other part might grab you. And that's even for me personally, I really enjoy meditating on the stories in the scripture and, and to consider what it must have been like to put myself in, a, in the place of different characters and, and uh, kind of try to understand their motivations and, and things like that. So you know, that's something that really speaks to me. But other, um, other types of literature are even more well-suited for meditation. And one, of, I would say, is poetry. Uh, poetry is a form that we expect depth of meaning from. You know, we expect that the, there, you're supposed to look at, look at it at a deeper level. That's, that's what people write poetry for. And, and perhaps the greatest source of insight into meditation, therefore, it comes from the book of Psalms. So here's a couple, a couple of verses that will get us set up. Uh, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works 
and consider what your hands have done. And in Psalm uh, 63, I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. And there's a couple different words in Hebrew that are translated as meditate. And those words are also translated in a whole bunch of other, other ways. Um, they are meditate, mourn, speak, imagine, study, mutter, utter, talk, complain, pray, commune, consider, muse, declare. So instead of talking about like what is a specific thing like, like meditation, am, am I doing it or, or not? We're going with a big definition, okay? So it's basically whatever you're doing with your brain space that's not directly required for whatever else you're trying to do. And this is really great because that means we can do, we can practice this a, a lot of times. You know, in some of those verses he said, uh, in your bed, when you lay down for, you know, night, um, or while you're working, or, or wh whatever you're doing through the day, if you're not, like, intensely focused on something, you know, if you're not, make, like, make sure you're driving safely, that's a really important one, but, you know, Sometimes, I, you know, I, 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 at work, you know, I, I do carpentry. That doesn't require intense thinking all the time. And sometimes I have to do stuff on the computer. And guess what? Doing spreadsheets doesn't always require a lot of intense thinking all the time either. So, so you, can, you can be thinking about uh, scripture and, and some of God's uh, blessings in, in both of those instances. Um, but when it, uh, consider the, the objects of meditation listed in the Psalms. There's five, five different things that he, he mentions here that we meditate on. So those are, um, I meditate on your word. That's the, kind of the starting place. It's the place where we learn about all the rest of these things. But he says, I meditate on days of long ago. So God's work in history. I meditate on all your works. God's acts of love, mercy, and justice. I meditate on what your hands have done. So God's creation. And I meditate on you, God himself. So, um, you, and you can, you can absolutely practice like on a list like this. You know, you could take a list like this and try to go through a passage and, and try to see if you can identify these different things to think of. And we're going to do a little bit about that um, today. But... Um, we we are gonna we are gonna have a guide, and this is this guy is even better than meditating uh, at meditating than than Richard Foster. Um, so he, this is our this is gonna be our, our little guide for today. This this little uh, lamp. And can anybody think of a time when lambs or sheep uh, are mentioned in the Bible? Like you know, yes, Amber. Passover, Psalm 23, both of those things will be covered. So there's a lot. That's the point. So, so even right now, you've just completed your first act of meditation because I said, think about the lamb, and you thought of something in the, the Bible that goes along with it. Um, so we're going to do a little practice here. And, and for myself, meditation usually naturally, it kind of naturally comes after prayer. And if something's bothering me or I have questions about something, um, I will start with prayer. But, you know, it, it says many words doesn't, God doesn't require many words to, to hear us. So, so the prayer part doesn't really take that long a lot of the time, you know. I say, okay, God, here's my problem. You know what it is. You understand it. What do I do? And that's about it. So that's the, that's the prayer part. And then the meditation co comes um, after where I start thinking about something in the word, usually. And it might be a, a verse uh, in the New Testament, or it could be some of these stories, whether it's in the gospel or something in the Old Testament. And, and it could be intentional, too. Like, if I'm just, tr like, if I'm trying to understand uh, a part of scripture, then, you know, I'll try to meditate on it. And uh, I, I usually do this while I'm, while I'm walking around. And I think that was the, the first thing in the book. He said, sit like with your hands in your lap and try to be still and practice that that doesn't work for me i have way too much add for that to work um and i think that's probably true for most people and honestly i don't know even in the bible a lot of times when people have the opportunity to sit in a chair and 
have, you know, fold their hands on their lap. So uh, they were they were busy. Um, but usually, you know, I will think about something for a while as I'm walking, and and God will speak by bringing other passages of Scripture to mind. And and if if there's a problem that I'm trying to answer, figure out what I should do about something, a lot of times a really simple answer will come come out of this. And and it could be something that pops into my mind after the prayer. Um, other times, this will lead to a greater wisdom, understanding um, of the passages. And then a, a lot of times, it, it'll lead to repentance. And this is the part of seeing, you know, God revealing what's inside, you know, because you start looking at a situation, you realize, oh, I've not been doing a good job in that area. And then finally, it, it kind of ends with worship because once you meditate on God's word and understand what he's speaking to you, then the natural outcome is that you, you worship. Um, so we're going to practice. We're going to meditate on the, on the word. And uh, the passage we're going to pick here is in Leviticus, everybody's favorite book. Um, now, if you didn't know this, like the Bible is really, it's got a lot of stuff about a diet, diet in it. I mean, the first, the first thing people did was mess up. There was one rule, don't eat this tree. They messed it up. And then we get, you know, and, the, and it ends with a big feast too, the Bible, you know. There's a wedding feast at the end. That's kind of the climax. So, so eating is important. And this is where God is giving uh, the Israelites some, some uh, instruction about what to eat, what not to eat. And, and, and because of this, every, t- every time you eat, any meal, that's a chance to meditate. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites, of the animals that live on land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. And at the end of the chapter, after he talks about the animals that they're like never supposed to eat, uh, he says, you must distinguish between unclean and the clean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. So what is that distinguishing? What, what does that require? It requires m- meditation. You have to think about what you're, what you're eating. So um, because of these categories, the, the animals that fit in that category are not so much. And the main ones that we hear mention of in the Bible is cows, sheep, and goats. That's what the Israelites primarily eat. Those are the animals that they're allowed to offer as sacrifice. Um, but sheep, I think, is kind of like the big one. Um, and all the, pa- you know, all the patriarchs of the Bible, so, so okay, so, you know, we're going to go to the next step. We're, we're going to meditate on God's work in history through this passage. And all the patriarchs of the Bible prior to Moses were shepherds, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and many of the women as well, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Zipporah. So um, they were so being a sh- God likes shepherds. He he picks them. Abel too, you know, right at the beginning, Cain and Abel. Um, Moses received training in the courts of e- the kings of Egypt, but this wasn't enough to lead the people out of Egypt. Um, this comes from Acts. This passage here. When Moses was forty years old. He decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was sending, was was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Okay, so God, Moses got his calling from God way back in Egypt, but he 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 wasn't ready. He didn't have the training. So, what kind of training did Moses need to become? the leader who could lead the Israelites. He had, to be, he had to go out into the desert for, for 40 years, and he was a shepherd. 40 years, 
spending with sh time with sheep out in the wilderness, and that changed him into the man that God wanted to lead the Israelites out. So, so that's uh, the, uh, how, how we see this play out in history. Next, um, we'll meditate on God's acts of love, mercy, and justice. So God chose lambs to use his people to deliver, uh, deliver them in the Passover, as uh, Amber said. And the, the blood of the spotless, innocent lambs was considered a, a suitable substitute for the firstborn child. And in the same way, God provided a ram for Abraham to offer instead of Isaac. So those are, the, in that sacrificial system, you know, we see that a lot. So these are, I'm going really fast because there's a bunch of stuff, but you can take these things and think about them more thoroughly on your own time. Next, we're going to talk about uh, God's creation. And when we consider this list of animals that God allows, he, he tells the Israelites that they can eat any animal that fits in these categories. And then he gives some specific examples of, of ones that don't fit. And it's something with what, what they eat, the way they eat, and the way that they move. And so we're going we're gonna to look at this and kind of learn some things. So first of all, sheep, they eat grass, okay? And as we mentioned, Adam and Eve, they, they broke... Um, they broke dietary uh, rule, and that kind of messed things up. And, and then when Noah came, there was actually a new set of, of rules. It was, it was, you can eat all the animals, just don't drink their blood. Um, but the sheep still eat according to God's original plan. In, in, in uh, Genesis 1, he said, to all the beasts of the earth, uh, I give um, every green plant for food. And it was so. So that was what every animal was supposed to eat. Sheep stayed with the plan the whole time. And this is, um, you know, the taste of an animal is, is affected by what they eat. The cheap meat is made from animals that eat cheap food. Sometimes it's so bad, you know, they have to get all sorts of medicines and antibiotics and stuff because we're feeding them stuff just to get them fat as quickly as possible. Um, but, and, and, and if you eat the, the, the bad animals, it's also not as good for you, right? So... The, the healthier animals are the ones that get grass. Like grass-fed meat is more expensive because it takes longer, but it's, it's better for you and it tastes better. So what you eat is really important. And, and of course, if you get like the most expensive beef, it's those Wagyu cows from Japan, and they get treated better than like most people. So, you know, so what you put in to your animals is what you get out of it. So this is something God's teaching the people through this. Um, so, it, you know, if we treat our animals let well, we can even get a glimpse of the world without death. Israel was called a land of milk and honey, and those are two nourishing foods that animals give us without having to die, and the quality of the milk is also really affected by what they eat. So you can, you know, if you want, you can... The cheapest experiment, get like the grass-fed butter and get the, the cheap butter and just do a little taste test and, you know, there's, there's something to it. But, of course, it's not just like about being healthy in the diet that God's teaching us here. Um, what we eat physically is important for our physical health, uh, but as believers, we also share with each other what we get from the, the word. And the, the word is the spiritual food that we eat. And God said, remember how the Lord your God led, led you all uh, the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to, that, to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And this is the one I got just from thinking about this in the, in the shower this morning. But manna, it means, what is it? So God feeds people questions like, here, here you go. What is it? They have to think, they don't even know what it is. Like he's feeding them, but, but it's also symbolic of his word that he wants us to ingest and as a form of meditation. 
So meditation means we consider what we ingest, what we are filling our eyes and ears with. Sometimes it's necessary to meditate on things that trouble us, but always digest our worries in the light of God's word. God's word is the perfect food for meditation. Next, um, sheep chew the cud or ruminate. And this word ruminate is synonymous for meditation, um, but it means to chew the cud. And, and the incredible ability of cows and sheep and goats is that they, they turn grass and weeds into food, you know? Uh, but the way that they do it is, is it's unique because they eat the grass, they swallow it, then they spit it up, and they chew it some more. And then they swallow it, and then they spit it up again and chew it some more. And then finally, um, each time, you know, after a little bit more nutrients is, is extracted, finally it's fully digested. And that's what it means to ruminate. And that's what we do with our thoughts. So when we hear or read something in scripture, uh, we can't assume to understand it all at once. We need to chew on it over and over. Sometimes we may hear something that challenges our previously held notions, or we might hear someone else share about sins and failures of, of people that have claimed to follow Christ. And, uh, you know, it, it, it troubles us. It, it causes us to re reassess things. And so we might have to take some of our old notions and spit them up. But we don't just reject it. You know, we don't just spit it up and leave. We, we spit it up what was troubling us. We chew on it. We think about it. And then until we can understand, you know, when we kind of see what's going on there. And this careful chewing means that sometimes you only need a small bite. So you could meditate for a long time on one verse or even just a phrase. All right. Last, lastly, the uh, last part about them, uh, about the sheep is that they walk on divided hooves. So um, the, the thing about hooves is, is all about keeping their feet out of the dirt. That's what like a lot of commentators I read said, you know, basically, uh, you know, you shouldn't eat anything that crawls around in the dirt. You shouldn't eat anything that walks on its paws. So anything that's got hooves is okay, but it has to be the divided hoof. So what's special about that? Um, well, sheep don't stay in one place. They move around, going from one field to another. Sometimes they might get lost. Um, you know, they can go in the mountains or the valley. Instead of s sitting in a stall all day, they see many different sights. And as the shepherd follows his flock, he, obs he also observes them from many different perspectives. And the divided hoof is more stable on uncertain ground. It means that sometimes we hold our positions a little loosely. We don't overcommit to something. You, sometimes you hear about Christians who they get challenged on, on one point of their faith, like maybe when a student goes to college or something, and the whole thing comes crumbling down. Well, they put too much weight on that one fact or that one element of their, of their um, notion of, of God and who he is. But if you, you know, if you're on the divided hoof, you're a little bit more stable. But you can also use this idea of divided hoofs to walk around, okay? And you see something from someone else's perspective, you know? You're standing over here, you see things that you couldn't see when you're standing on the other side. And that's a very important part of, of um, meditating. Um, and like I said, for me, physically walking around is also a really useful aid to meditation. Some people can do it sitting still, but I like going out in nature and walking or even just walking around uh, a room. It, it helps, helps me to focus. So, um, so, those are, so those are some of the things. Now, I want to kind of give a, a little more application to this thing. Um, herding sh sheep doesn't require constant effort like working the land does, yet it does require constant attention and it requires patience. And the well-raised sheep give the shepherd their absolute trust. And by meditating on the word, on the history of God's provision uh, and his enduring love and mercy, King David realized that just as sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd, so we rely on God. 
And, and, and it was this meditation out in the fields that led him to pen these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me behind, uh, beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I'm going to try to get through this quick, um, but to contrast, thinking about some of these other animals, God said, don't eat. Camels, camels are great. Um, there's tribes in the desert that rely on camels for everything. They drink camel milk and make camel cheese and all that stuff. But a camel can go like 10 days without drinking water. And so, uh, and the people that raise them, they don't put down roots. So if you're learning, what, what the lessons you learn from a camel are all about self-reliance. That's not what God wants for us necessarily. He wants us to trust in him. Um, and some of these other ones, like it, it talks about uh, uh, a, a hyrax or a coney. It hides in the rocks and rabbits kind of hide in the underbrush. You know, that's like, that's not what God, God wants us to be doing. He doesn't want us to, to survive by hiding. He wants us to rely on him. And, uh, and pigs, of course, um, you know, my, my Jewish friend said, like, this, these rules are special for the people of Israel, and if you're not Jewish, you should be enjoying pork because it's a blessing that God has given you that he hasn't given to our people. So just so you know, that's the, the Jewish perspective. And, and, and see, the thing is, pigs are a great choice if you're moving into a new country because pigs don't require as much maintenance. They gain a lot of weight. Uh, they can eat almost anything. They reproduce fast. They actually can become a nuisance. Like, you know, there's all these wild pigs here in Texas. Um, but how does that affect the person that's raising the animals, you know? Uh, uh, I know some Gabriel's raising a pig over at the agricultural program, and that pig's going to be a great pig because he's taking good care of it. But not everybody takes good care of their pigs. Um, and consider the story of the prodigal. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomachs with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So a pig farmer is not going to care about people the same way that a shepherd will. And he didn't know that. He had to learn that the hard way. It's very easy for us to live lives of uh, small consequence. You know, we live in a disposable age. There isn't much that we can't replace. Very little of what we interact with is truly precious. If anything bad happens, we have insurance. But for a shepherd, the continuation of a household depends on the survival of a flock. And for that reason, David was willing to risk his life against lions and bears to defend his sheep. And in fact, he seemed to understand sheep much better than people, which is why the prophet used a parable about sheep, about a lamb, to bring him to repentance. The Lord sent Nathan, uh, Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, You are that man. So, you know, sometimes we think eating isn't such a big deal, 
until somebody eats what belongs to you. And the culmination of David's long years of meditating in the pasture came back to fruition at this moment. Because even before his sin with Bathsheba, David had a bad track record as a, a husband and a father. And for whatever reason, it was this story that caused him to see what he had done through the eyes of his heavenly father. David still had a lot of sorrows after this point, many of them connected to his previous fa failures as a father. But the difference for his son Solomon, the future king, was that he was raised by a father who understood repentance. And this is one of the, the final things that, that uh, it leads to. Meditation leads us to repentance. Suppose one of you had 100 sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And so, of course, those are the words of Jesus. And this is the last thing we meditate on. We meditate on Jesus, on God himself. And Jesus, he is the good shepherd. He's the one that leaves the 99 to seek after just the one that was lost. But he's the one that was, he was both the shepherd and he's the lamb. In uh, John 10, he speaks about being the good shepherd. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. You should check out on YouTube, there's videos of shepherds calling their sheep, and other people will come and try to call them, and they don't listen. But when the shepherd speaks, they come. It's pretty cool. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And the final step of this meditation process, is, as I said, is usually worship because you become overwhelmed by God's power and his majesty. And when we meditate on God's word, we catch a, a glimpse of the depth, what it truly means. And this causes our hearts to rejoice in the Lord and in what he has done. Because Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Yet he's also the shepherd who became a sheep. The God who became a man to die on our behalf the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, you know, the Bible, it really is a book. It's really a diet book. You know, it started off, we went from do not eat, and then we had to distinguish between what may and may not be eaten. But when Jesus com comes, he says, come and eat. And, and the thing that he offers is his body and his blood. And... Uh, you know, if I thought ahead of time, we probably should have done communion. <laughs> but every time you do that, think about that. God's giving you something to ingest, representative of his word that gives us life. And we chew on it, we think on it, we meditate on what he has done for us. It's, it's not a magical token that changes us. It's through that constant thinking on, on what he's done and his act of love for us. And uh, that's what transforms us. So everything that we see around us, there's something that you can connect to God's love and his mercy for us. And that's why meditation is such an important thing for us to practice. So to conclude, just to reiterate, meditate by ingesting the word. We meditate by chewing the cud 
and walking on divided hooves, and we let meditation lead us to wisdom, to repentance, and to worship. I was just going to close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the many, many, many ways that you have chosen to speak to us and reveal ourselves to you. And I pray that as we go throughout the week, we open up your word, we uh, hear the words that you speak, that you would truly help us to remember to see those words as food that nourishes our soul and help us to chew on it. And so it, it begins to transform us. And I pray that you would give us all an experience of your glory and your awesome power and your love for us so that we would worship and glorify you through this. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.